So if you are a veteran, would you please stand? Let us see you. Thanks so much. What a great thing to be able to do and to fall into what God wants us to have as individuals. We'll get rid of the hum. There it is. We have some technical difficulties, but don't worry. I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm fine. Hey, thank you for coming today. I told you half the country would be happy and happy would be very unhappy. There are things that we need to make sure to be thankful for relative to all this, though. We need to pray that under the superintending authority of the Lord of this universe, that Joe Biden is president, and we need to pray for him. He's still got some work to do. We need to pray because Donald Trump's going to be president. And for all of the other elections, that whether they fail your way or not, here's the thing to constantly remember, for which we can be thankful. There is a God who's the King of kings and Lord of lords, who lives in unapproachable light, who ultimately is the wonderful counselor, mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, we need to constantly remember that all authority is under his umbrella of authority. And we need to be able to say amen to that. So some of you feel like going, amen, woo! Other people of you are like, man, surpass the tissues. No, celebrate, because we have a home in heaven and a purpose on earth. And he has promised to those who love him life and life more abundant. But I would say this. There are people that came here today struggling with something that's much closer than who you voted for. There are people that are struggling with things that are issues in their lives. There are people in this room that need to do something about that. And as a matter of fact, this week ago, Wednesday, when 120, 150 students gathered together, they did this exercise at the conclusion of their time together. And essentially the prompt for was for them to come and to write on the, on the piece of parchment that we have here, some butcher paper, what God came through for them when they went through something very difficult. Here's some of the things they said. God did not leave me, my mom, when my mom and dad was going through to split up. He never left. God never left my side when I thought I wasn't going to make it. He never lost faith in me. God showed up for me when I didn't know what to do. I'd been sad and miserable every day. God showed up for me when my mom was struggling with addiction and it put me in a horrible headspace. God showed up for me when I lost that friend. I felt like I did something even though I did not. God gave me a sense of peace and contentment and I thank him for that. Jesus, you saved me during my divorce. You showed up, obviously one of our student workers. My brother's recovery from addiction. You showed up. My health, my dad getting drunk. God showed up for that person. My mom's death. God showed up. When I felt empty, alone, and depressed after my dad had died, he was there for me. He helped me find happiness. God showed up. Amen. When I didn't believe in him and myself, God showed up. When no one else did, God showed up. He helped me get over the time someone I really liked hurt me. Dear Lord, you helped me through the death of my mom, abuse, self-harm. You told me I was beautiful when I felt ugly over a lot of times. You showed up and comforted me when I wanted to relapse and didn't because you showed, showed, showed me I didn't need to. Lord, you have led me from a lot. I've been six months clean. You've been there for me when I needed to be, there for others, but I needed someone to be there for me. Thank you, Lord. And this is what it looks like. It stretches all the way across the stage, and I've asked Justin and um, Remy to help today to let you see what that looks like. But also, I'm going to ask him to lay this down because we did this during the first service, and we invite you to do the same thing as well, too. And this might seem to be something that is uh, unusual to do, um, but, but we want you to come do it as soon as God prompts you. We had people that were writing as soon as we put these markers down because there's something that you need 
for us to pray about. There's something and something somewhere for which you can be thankful where God showed up. And so during this service beginning right now, it might seem really weird to some of you, to people to get up while somebody is talking, but I invite you to do exactly that and thank Remy and Justin for being here with us today. How did God show up for you? He showed up for her. He showed up for the others that are getting up on this side and those that are getting up here in the middle and those that are getting in the back. God had showed up for them. Ultimately, what are you thankful for today? And how can you be thankful? Well, at the end of a book called First Thessalonians, actually a letter, the first literature probably written in all the New Testament, in chapter 5, verses 15 through 22, Paul's writing to a group of people in Thessalonica, and it's the end of the letter. And at the end of the letter, ultimately, thank you so much for coming up here. By the way, you have permission to come do this right now. You do not have to wait. It will be better if you got it on your mind right now to do it exactly right now. At the end of this letter, he says something that is really, really important. So back in the day when I was the Dean of Admissions and Enrollment Management at Gardner-Webb, which was basically a title for director of sales and keeping them from leaving, <laughs> essentially, is that we were big in the world of direct mail at that time. And so direct mail is not as big a thing as it is, or as it was back then, because we have email and texting and various things like that. But the people that I did direct mail with, with whom we spent hundreds of thousands of dollars to recruit students to come to Gardner-Webb, said that the PS is the most important part of the letter. It's the very last thing you see, but most people's eyes are drawn to the PS before they read anything else, in part because they understand that that there's a reason you put it apart from that. Incidentally, too, we learned this as well. How many of you actually still subscribe to magazines that arrive like in your mailbox and are made of paper, all right? Would you raise your hand? Okay, what are some of the names of the magazines you subscribe to? If it's Playboy, don't tell us, all right? Wild Duck for Hunting. Wild Duck for Hunting, that's better. Somebody else, you got to hit your hand up. ESPN, dun, 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 dun. all right, who else? Our State. Our State Magazine, that came up in the first service as well. Y'all are educated, edumacated people, I like it. Well, here's the deal. Do you know the most expensive part of most magazines in which to advertise? The last page. A lot of times people open, they go to the very last page in the back cover, and it's the most expensive part it used to be. And there's a point to this, is that ultimately Paul is writing this group of people in Thessalonica. He wants them to understand this is his PS. This is his punch home. He is bringing it up. Scott, would you bring the podium up? He's bringing it up to bear so people understand what it is. And you need to understand that this is kind of be read, should be read as a whole, as a block, as as something. We're going to kind of tear it apart today and to talk about it and see what actually it means to us. But before we do that, let's bow our heads and our hearts in prayer. Heavenly Father, you said so much, you've done so much, and now we listen to what it is that you told him then. These words are as true now today as they were 2,000 years ago plus. They'll be true 2,000 years from now if you tarry and you do not come back. But Father, we ask that you give us the ability to learn how to live richly and to be rich in the way that we live our lives. And we ask this in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. So the first thing I would say to you today is simply something that my grandmother would say and my grandfather would say. For about 18 to 24 months, we lived on a farm in Conway after the death of my father with my parents and my grandparents and aunts and uncles close by. And when there was something to be done, my grandfather and my grandmother would basically say, see to it. See to it. It doesn't mean don't think about it, don't consider it, don't say when your time is finished playing video games, which didn't exist back then when the dinosaurs were on the earth and the pterodactyls flew in the sky. No, they said, see to it, go do it. And so here's what Paul is saying. He makes it very simple for us as well. He says, see that no one repays evil for evil, but always seek to do good for one another and to everyone. See to it to do good and to leave evil. See to it. So one of the things that Keanu has already talked about so beautifully, and and I'm so grateful for in an overflowing heart as your pastor, is the generosity and the love and the kindness that you demonstrate visibly as a church. It's been incredible to see what's happened. As a matter of fact, we can't even begin to start to count the thousands and tens of thousands of dollars of resources that we've been able to distribute 
just following Hurricane Helene. And I'm just grateful for you guys. I'm just going to give you a hand. You don't have to give a hand to yourself. You can if you want to. But, but when you've chosen to give, you do extraordinary things. One of the things that we do every Christmas, and we're starting it today, is this thing called First Gift. And so the First Gift is for people in our community who would otherwise, much like many of you have already done, to contribute Thanksgiving turkeys and, and food for them. This is an opportunity for you to help make Christmas happen for their kids. You're going like, well, how do we know they really need it? Because we work with the Belmont Community Organization, the Community Relief Organization. We've worked with the YMCA, at least of these Carolinas in the past. And we know these people are in need. And so after the service, there's some folks out in the lobby that are going to be holding these little angels, and on the angels are lists of the grit, the gifts that kids want for Christmas. And if you are interested in doing that, I challenge you to do that. But cause see to it to do, do the good, do the good. See to it to shun that which is evil. See to it to do that which is right, but to leave the wrong behind. And if God inspires you to do so, I challenge you to take initiative to grab those. Incidentally, you better grab them in a hurry because they usually go fast. Here's the second thing: make a choice to rejoice. Make a choice to rejoice. He says, rejoice always. Everybody say that. Rejoice always. Say it with conviction. Rejoice always. That means when things are good and when things are bad and everything in between. How do you rejoice always? How is that even possible? How do you make the choice to rejoice in the midst of difficult circumstances and seasons of life? Um, Daryl Robinson, who leads our prayer team and gathers together with me on Wednesdays for the last 12 to 15 years at 10 o'clock, driving sometimes an hour and a half to two hours to come back and pray with me from his job. Prays on Saturday evenings from six to eight o'clock for people that are in need. And also has prayed for you and even prayed over the seat in which you're sitting in that God would, be, would bless you in this anointed place today. Well, something I've learned about him over time, it's kind of a code word. Sometimes when something bad happens or something hard happens, and especially in those times, he'll say out loud in prayer, glory to God. And so what I've learned is that's kind of shorthand for, even though this is hard, I'm going to make a choice to rejoice. I'm going to make a choice to say, God, glory for this hard test at work. Thank you for this hard test at home. Thank you for this hard child to deal with. Thank you for this hard thing that's going on in my life. If you can say glory to God and exercise your thank thankfulness muscle when you've broken a bone or you've lost a job or you're losing a person in your life, ultimately, God is going to make your life better on this earth. Gratitude and thankfulness will become part of what it is that's at the core of your being. People say a lot of times, I, I run some friends of mine that are mechanics, and every time I take my car in, they'll say, hey, what you doing this week? We know you only work Sunday for a couple of hours. <laughs> and I'll say, man, I wish I, I've seen more of the life and the death and the hard and the good and the bad every day than you probably see in a lifetime. Yesterday, we had a funeral for a family. Yesterday, I had time to celebrate with my grandson, and we went and did something fun together last night. But all week long, my heart has been Richard and Katie Rossmeyer. Richard and Katie were married here about eight or nine years ago. They have a child, Emma Ruby, and Katie has been taken off of life support because she has no brain activity because of something that invaded her body. How do you make a choice to rejoice then, Pastor Ray? How do you make a choice to rejoice and say, how do you go through this, Richard? and Denise, and John, and Emma Ruby. I don't know. But in some way, shape, or fashion, maybe God is protecting her for something. We know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love him and to those who are called according to his purpose. But you know, and I know, and they know right now, there's no feeling of wanting to rejoice. Then he says, pray without ceasing. <laughs> pray always. Uh, here's what always means. Always means always. Pray always. Now, how do you do that? There's one of my favorite comedians, if you ever are scrolling through and you want to see somebody that is reasonably clean and you can let your children listen to it, is Angela Johnson's one of my favorite comedians. She talked about her abuela, who was somebody that uh, ran, got a flat tire beside the road, and she goes to help her abuela to get her flat tire changed. And because she goes to help her abuela to get that grandmother, I think that is that what that is in Spanish. I thank you. Thank you very much for those of you that know. Um, she said, I started to pray for my cousin Julie and my cousin Jimmy and hope their flat tar tires don't go flat. And you know the kind of thing where you can kind of become ridiculous with something? And then I can't think about anything about keeping people not having flat tires. No, no here's what it really means from my perspective. It means keeping an open mic with God. Keep the mic open constantly. 
He's constantly talking. He's constantly superintending the universe. He constantly speaks through his word. That's why it's so important for you to know it, handle it, get a chance to know what is true and absolute because God is constantly speaking. And to me, he constantly speaks each day. And it's not ever a, a, an audible voice. It's sometimes an impression. Yesterday was a very busy day. Um, for literally, almost from dawn to dark, but certainly from a little bit past dawn all the way past to dark. And there was something else I was coming home and I was prepared to do. And, and God said, don't do that. You need to go sit in the chair and you need to chill out after you have a brief conversation with Andrea because I need you to save your energy for tomorrow morning. I listened and obeyed. I've got energy for today. But also there's, there's things where God speaks to you and he whispers to you, do this for that person. Pick up the phone and call that person. Send that person this email. Take the angel and make Christmas happen for this child. When we listen, God speaks to us. And more often than not, he speaks to us in a way that is very specific to us and specific to our circumstance. Let me ask you a question. Am I the only crazy one here? Or do you sometimes hear just God's inner voice to say, go this way, not that way? Anybody else in here like, thank you very much. You're making me feel better. Either we can be in therapy together or we're living an abundant life together. Pray always. He says, pray without ceasing. Then he says this, in everything, give thanks, not for everything. He says, in all circumstances. Give thanks in all circumstances for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. I wouldn't dare to go to say Richard and Katie right now and invite you to pray for them. This is a time where life support has been taken off and, and their heart is broken. But would you pray that God would give them energy and joy and that they will know that they are not alone in these circumstances? In all circumstances, give thanks, not for them. I would never say, hey, you need to give thanks for this, Richard. Hey, you need to give thanks for this, Denise. No, this beautiful couple married right here who took their vows with promise. God has given them eight, nine wonderful years together. A beautiful child, Emma Ruby. Thank you for her. But in these difficult circumstances, we give you thanks because you're doing something. Maybe it's so we can love more deeply those that we have beside us. And love this one and his family, her losing the one that they promised to be with her in goodness and hard times and sickness and in health. To love and to cherish until they take their last breath. Today, if you're sitting with somebody you love, reach out and squeeze them and tell them you love them. Give them a kiss on the cheek. Bump their fist. Now, if you didn't come with them, this is getting weird. (laughs) But it's okay. Everybody say in, In. not of. Everybody say in. In. Everybody not for. He says in, not of it, not for it. But in all things, all circumstances, give thanks. Let me ask you this question. How many of you have something to thank, be thankful for very specifically? Do you remember that person you dated in high school and you just really wanted to marry? And you had the wedding when you were like tw- in 10th grade. You remember what I'm talking about? And, and, and now aren't you glad you didn't? Right? You show up at the high school reunions. Any of y'all ever been to those things? I've only been to one. You know, you go back to high school reunions and you see your old girlfriend, your old boyfriend, you go, oh, Lord God, thank you for delivering me. <laughs> right? Are you serious? In all things, give thanks, right? Next, don't stop the one who fills you up. Don't stop up the one who fills you up. This is curious part of scripture. He says, don't quench the spirit. Do not quench the spirit. How do you quench something? Well, certainly you quench your thirst. You need more than just water when you're dehydrated and you need salt and you need electrolytes and make sure to use your Gatorade or Powerade or drink of choice. But, but this is very specific to fire. It's not about quenching the thirst of your body. Instead, it's about quenching a fire. Listen, where God has started a fire, then don't try to pour something on to pour it out. Where, where God has started a fire, don't try to say, I'm going to put that out because I don't want to deal with that right now. Even if it's hard. Even if, especially, it is hot. Because during that time, what God is doing is he's taking the the part of your life and he is burning away that which is unessential. When silver is purified, the dross is burned away by heat. 
and every other precious metal, be it gold or platinum. It's part of the way that it does. Where there's a fire that is happening, don't pour water on something that God is starting a fire with. Now, sometimes you need to. If your house is on fire, pour water on it. I'm not saying that. You know what I'm talking about, though. What's God poured a fire on in this life? What's, what's happening? And take, take the initiative not to pour water onto it, to try to, to turn it out, to try to discourage someone else. Ultimately, God wants to do something powerful as he burns some things away and to be thankful for those things, too. Perhaps today you're, you're dealing with something that's going on in your job or something that's going on in your marriage or something that's going on with your children or, or your grandchildren or brothers or sisters. Um, you've got Thanksgiving coming up and you don't really want to hang around the people you know you're going to be forced to hang around with. How do you deal with that? More about that in the next couple of weeks as we prepare for the day of Thanksgiving. Finally, two more things. Handle truth to test for good. Handle the truth to test for good. How do you know what is true unless you've handled the truth? Ladies and gentlemen, this is the truth from beginning to end. That the difficult things to understand and the easy things to understand. The comforting things and the challenging things. This is the truth. And God wants us to take his truth given to us and apply it through our minds and our hearts and our souls to life. This year, we began this year with the whole idea that we learned to love the Lord our God with all of our heart and our soul and our mind and our strength and our neighbor as ourself. And this year, we've learned that. We've learned many things, not just from what we've learned from this pulpit, but in the way that we've sought to apply that in our lives. Are we right? I've used this illustration before, but you know, every time a bank teller learns uh, what a true $20 bill or a $100 bill feels like, they, they, they take them and they train them and they, they learn what there's a certain feel to it. There's a certain way they look at it. Now, you also notice when you go to Food Line or to Publix or whatever, if you give them a large bill or something like that, they'll take it and they'll hold it up and they'll look for the watermark and they'll take a little pen and, and write across it and that kind of stuff to make sure that it makes a mark. My, my brother Roger um, treated me to lunch on Friday and he pulled out a $100 bill. I was like, hey, my brother's living in the high life. I'm loving this. He said, that's a special thing. I've been saving it for a special occasion. So anyway, she pulled it up. She looked at it and I said, man, I don't know what the problem is. He just printed it and it's still warm. I mean, what's wrong? <laughs> Learn to handle that, which is true. Look what scripture says. Do not despise prophecies, but test everything. Hold fast to that which is good. Ladies and gentlemen, God set it up. Humankind messed it up. God called us back through prophets. He bought us back through Jesus. He raised him from the dead, and now his spirit lives us in us until he comes back. He's coming back. Don't despise those prophecies. Look forward to that time. But if we take our last breath on this earth before he chooses to come back, we are thankful that to be immediately to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. But in the meantime, test that which is true. And here's finally what I want to say to you today. Shun all that's evil. Shun it. Shun it. When you shun somebody, it's kind of like the old thing we used to say uh, back in the day. Talk to the hand. <laughs> somebody comes in there, kind of run their mouth at you. Right? Talk to the hand. I want to encourage you to do something. If you are married, don't do that ever. <laughs> It's just not a good thing. You might get slapped with a hand if you say talk to the hand, right? If you're, if you're a child and you're, your parents saying something to you about it, talk to the hand. That is not going to go well for you. But here's the general gist of what he's saying. When evil shows up, say, no, no, I'm not going there. I'm not making that decision. I'm not entering that confrontation, uh, that conversation or that confrontation or that flirtation or any other Asian. I'm going to shun it. I'm going to leave it because that will destroy me. Don't even entertain it. He says, abstain from every form of evil. Taken together. See that no one repays anyone evil for evil, but always seek to do good to one another and to everyone. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophecies, but test everything. Hold fast what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. Here's the deal. So thankfulness takes training. It means saying glory to God when it's hard. Glory to God when he comes through for you. Glory to God when it's good and it's wonderful. And it's a boy or it's a girl 
Or it's a hot meal at Thanksgiving with sweet potatoes and pecans on the side and the top of it. Thank you, God, when my stomach is growling. Not because it's growling, because you're teaching me something in all the circumstances of my life. So thankfulness becomes part of us when we practice it. You need to exercise thankfulness daily. It's a muscle. (laughs) Thank you, God, when I win. Thank you, God, even if I lose, I've learned something from the way that I lost so that I can win perhaps next time. Thank you, God, when I'm full because I'm full. Thank you, God, when I'm empty because when I'm empty, it reminds me that you alone make it possible for me to be full. Thank you, God, when we're happy. Thank you, God, when love is flowing through our home. And thank you, God, when it's hard because it reminds us of those times when love was good and we were kind to one another. Ladies and gentlemen, as we enter into this holiday season, the chief decision you and I are going to choose to make is are we going to be thankful and grateful? Are we going to be greedy and unthankful and hurtful? You get to decide. Finally, today, I want to challenge you to exercise that thankfulness in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's not possible. It's not possible for you to understand what God is doing for you until you have God in you. And Jesus came to make it possible for his spirit to come and live inside of you. So today, if you're within the sound of my voice, I'm going to invite you to bow your heads and hearts in prayer. For those of you that are watching online, thank you for joining with us as well. Today, the signature decision of all of our lives begins with this, and this is why we consistently offer this time of invitation. If you're a Christ follower, pray for the one in front of you, behind you, beside you, those that are watching online from a distance right now and clicking on later this week. Have you accepted the love and the grace and the forgiveness of Jesus Christ? That is the beginning point of living a thankful life and a rich life. How do you do this, Pastor Ray? It's very simple, but it means you got to do something. It's got to happen inside of you. So you say, dear Jesus, please forgive me of my sins. Thank you for dying for me, for coming to live for me. I'm giving you my life because you gave me your life. Make it even simple. Dear Jesus, I give you my life because you gave me yours.